we can go ahead and get started. I know we're going to get some more folks in, but we want to get started so you can hear from this really great panel. Um, you are in this webinar. If you're um, going to another webinar that's on another topic on loans or marketing or anything else, then you're in the wrong webinar. You might want to try another link. Um, this is one specifically focused on contracting and succeeding with anchor procurement. Um, for a lot of business owners um, at the local level, you want to talk to the folks that are doing the buying, folks that are putting out the bids, folks that are going to have the opportunities. Well, here you go. You got a really great panel, a rock star panel of different anchors from around the county, from different organizations. Um, so this is a really great um, webinar that we've set up in partnership with our part of our family here at FIU with Startup FIU Procurement and Barbara. Um, so I know you didn't log in to hear me, but my name is Brian Van Hook. I'm regional director. I'm uh, with the Small Business Development Center under FIU. If you're in Miami-Dade County or Monroe County, we are your local Small Business Development Center. Um, we're here to help you start your business. We're help, here to help you grow your business. And um, we have a great, really great team of 26 business specialists that can help you with everything from access to capital, government contracts, um, international trade. And we're really proud last year that during the pandemic, we were able to help businesses to secure $78 million in government contracts because um, every dollar of those contracts is somebody that hired somebody else, was able to keep the doors open, keep business going. And so that's what you're here for right now is to hear from this really great panel. And so we'll be around um, if we can help you in any way. Um, and I'll be around at the end for some questions, but I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Barbara with Startup FIU Procurement. And just really um, in the chat, please put who you are and then also in the Q&A, please put your questions and we'll make sure we can get to the questions. And please ask a lot of questions. We don't wanna hear crickets. None of these panelists are shy. They all have a lot of knowledge. They have a lot of really great information. So please put a lot of really good questions in there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Barbara. Thank you, Ryan. And as usual, it's really great to share the space with all of you. Thanks for everyone to connect. Uh, my name is Barbara Cotto, as uh, Brian uh, mentioned. We are partners of the SBDC. Uh, we are Startup FIU Procurement, an initiative that was born back in 2018 with the purpose of helping small and minority owned businesses unlock wealth. And by doing so, we show you multiple routes and one of them is succeeding in government and anchor contracting, reason why we are here this evening. With that, I would love to introduce uh, an amazing team of friends and partners who have been amazing in the journey of understanding how it's needed and how do we, let's say, put things together and in perspective in order to be successful procuring with anchors and procuring with government institutions. And at first, I would like to introduce LaWanda Robinson, SBD Chief section at uh, the Miami-Dade County Internal Services Department. Welcome, Lawanda. Also, I would like to introduce uh, Lindsay Collazo. Lindsay is the Director for Supplier Diversity at Supply Chain Services at University of Miami. Welcome, Lindsay. I would also like to introduce Amari Ginao, uh, Community and Citizenship Senior Coordinator at Turner Construction. Welcome, Amaury. And last, but one of my favorites, and he knows about it, Mr. Junior Anderson, District Director, Office of Economic Opportunity and Miami-Dade Public Schools. Thank you for joining us this evening and for giving us the opportunity to put this uh, together for our team. We also have uh, other collaborators in the space for UM and the schools that might be able to support us as well. I would like, uh, if possible, to start with you guys on the very basics. And I'm gonna leave the question open uh, to any of you to get started on the discussion. And from that point on, we see what comes in. So I would like to start the floor by asking if a business is not or with an anchor institute, they be starting. So on that note, 
I think you froze up, Barbara. I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So, right when you froze, 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 froze the technology. You know, the way All right, works. there goes the internet connection. So where did yeah. I leave you guys? Did you guys get to hear my question? No. <laughs> All right. So the first question or the icebreaker is if a business is not currently working with government or an anchor institution and wants to get into contracting, where should they get, get started? LaWanda, would you like to break the ice? Sure, I'll break the ice. Um, if a business feels that they are prepared to do work uh, with a government entity, whether it's local, state, or federal, um, first and foremost, of course, they need to be uh, legally established and have um, everything in order as far as their paperwork and documentation. And you need to now become registered with that um, public entity because they don't know you exist unless you are um, you register with them. So you can register as a vendor with them. You can register with a vendor with the state, with the, the feds, with the county. You need to register because that's how any of them will know that you exist and what you want to sell to the county. Um, and once you register with them as a vendor, you want to also register in any of their bid programs. Um, and so some of them have um, BizSync, Periscope, um, DemandStar, you name it, various um, um, systems that most part are at no cost to you, but if you want additional leads that can send you those bids, you have to pay a cost, but definitely that's how you know what exists out there by um, registering for those solicitations. And then the most simple part is just going to their websites and looking to see you know, what the procurement department or what their individual departments are selling. You'll be surprised how much information is on um, the websites as far as departments. And you can't break that system when you're checking for information. So be the first fundamental uh, recommendations that I would make. Very good. Thank you, Lawanda. In terms of anchors, and when we are talking about anchors, we talk about those institutions that have been uh, located in a specific area for a very long time, that they don't get impacted by the different politic changes or inflation, deflation, if we want to describe it somehow, such as hospitals, such as universities and other entities. So taking from that perspective, Lindsay, can you give us some insight on how to get started with anchors? Sure, yes. Um, so we've actually developed a, a form to assist with recruiting. It's actually a, a Qualtrics link. Um, it's a quick survey where um, businesses can go in and enter some information um, and it'll assist us in actually um, making connections at the university to the appropriate uh, contracting specialists as well as the department. So it's a Qualtrics link. We also have a QR code associated with this as well. And I'm happy to share that out um, after this webinar um, to all the attendees as well so they can um, go in and, and complete that short survey. Very good, thank you. Amari, how is it in Turner? How is it that you connect with the community? How is it that they can find out about the opportunities? Because you work actually on both ends. Uh, you do the government contracting, you do the anchor contracting, and you're at the community as well. So how does it work for Turner? For Turner, it's still pretty traditional, uh, believe it or not. So yes, similar to Luanda, you know, you need to get in our system, you need to get pre-qualified, just so we understand what we're looking at, what services you provide, and just who are you, at least on paper. But beyond that, um, you need to actually engage us and us, it's mean, meaning me at this point, um, so just to get your foot in the door so I can understand what projects might be good fits for you, or at least just to allow you to be able to navigate us. You might know someone at, at a Turner job site, you know, a superintendent or an engineer you built a relationship with because you were on that project, but that might not be the right person that you're speaking to. So for me, I'll be able to say, hey, look, based on your, pre-qualifications based on the services you provide, you should be speaking to so-and-so. And then that way I can connect you to that individual through our open door sessions and say, hey, let's set up a meeting two weeks from today and you'll actually get to talk to procurement. That way procurement can give you insight on what we're doing, what's going on and how you can actually fit to the picture. Whether it's something like, well, right now you've only been in business for a year, maybe you can go to Turner School brush up on some of the things that you might have to have on the administrative end, or if you're ready to start bidding and say, hey, these bids are coming up on this date, make sure you make deadlines, make sure your estimates on point and participate. So for us, it's a lot of relationship building. It's still really old school with regards to 
sending an email, getting a response, and then setting up a meeting. Very good to understand. And, and it's very important because as you guys heard from Lindsay, uh, Lawanda, and Amari, everything starts by, first of all, having a proper business, a business established, and then understanding where do you need to actually go to. But on that same note, uh, my next question will be, what is it that, or what does government and anchor institution expect out of these small businesses uh, looking to do business with them? And for that, Junior, I, I would like for you to take the word on that one. What is expected, at least on the school side? Well, on the school side, um, they've got to show that they've got the capacity to do the work. And they've also got to show that they're reliable and cost effective as well. Sometimes one of the things, and I think um, Lawanda would agree with me with this, is that sometimes there's some firms where we talk about certification, which we'll talk about later on, right? Um, when you get certified, there are advantages to that, right? Uh, businesses get points or we can shelter the market for small businesses and all the rest of it. But at the same time, you still have to, have to look at your pricing, your pricing strategy. And one of the best ways of doing that is by looking at old bids, all right? And some of the things also that I would have to say is you've got to, whether, if you've got to, if you go by the terms and conditions of the bid, you've got to actually um, make sure that you abide by the terms and conditions of the bid. There have been times when um, some businesses have won a bid and then they can't seem to abide by the terms and conditions. They're continually late in delivery um, so if we say in the bid that it's supposed to take seven days to deliver the item, sometimes it could take 10 days, then obviously there's going to be a problem because you're not abiding by the terms and conditions of the bid, of the contract. Um, one of the other things too that I realize is, is that there are, and this is what, what I want small business to understand, is that if you do not abide by the terms and conditions of the bid with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, there are other agencies that will call us you may have won a bid with another agency like Palm Beach, and they will call us to find out if you've been a good, um, a good, you know, you've been reliable in providing the good or service. So these are things that are very, very important that you've got to do. You've got to be reliable, cost effective, and show that you've got the capacity to do the work. Very good. Thank you, Junior. Something that you would like to add, Lawanda, on the county side. Um definitely being reliable, um, truly understanding what the bid and the scope of work is asking. Um, don't be so desperate to get in the door with any entity that you shortchange yourself. If you know your worth as a business capacity, you're going to bid what you know you need to bid. And, and that's taken into consideration, you know, whether it's your overhead, your employees, equipment, inventory, whatever it may be. But key is ask questions. If you don't quite understand what the bid document is asking for, usually there's a Q&A time period, but ask the questions because just because something um, states that they, uh, they want a, a particular task done, there may be five pieces to that process to get that task done. And so you bid just assuming you're finishing, you're at A, B, C, D, E, at E. But did you take in consideration all the steps A, B, C, D to get to E? And now you may have shortchanged yourself don't assume the owner or the prime um, is going to do that. So be ask the question. A lot of people say, oh, it's too much. No, if you read and you read and you ask and you ask, you'll be surprised how much you truly understand um, what they're asking for. And then, then you make an educated decision to say, you know what, I can do this or I'm not ready for this just yet. And so that's very important. Be, be open to ask the question because you may be great your craft but doing business with a public entity or with the turners of the world there's a different expectation and so knowing what that is and it's okay to ask questions about old contracts and making sure you have a, a, an idea of what we are looking for to add to Lawanda's point I think that is very important also to understand what is your capacity can you really go after that request for proposal do you have the assets the bonding the insurance that is needed to pursue it? Do you have the experience, the aggregate to go after it? And if you don't, are you aware that there are other options where you could start procuring with anchors and the government that not necessarily is a formal proposal, but it may be a request for quote 
for a low hanging fruit job as we will call them, which is something smaller. That option is out there and that's part of the process that also on our end, FIU offers. Is it similar at UM, Lindsay? Yes, um, definitely. We have um, we have competitive bid process as well, but we also um, procure a lot of um, smaller items and goods addition, in addition to that. Um, just to add, you know, we're definitely looking for um, in a recruitment mode at the, at the moment, the University of Miami. Um, I myself am a dedicated resource to um, the supplier diversity efforts. And, um, you know, we're looking for um, high quality, um, excellent products and goods. And we know that many um, small businesses can provide those needs. Um, so I think it's really important to just um, distinguish yourself to provide that competitive edge and, you um, um, again, ask questions. If there's questions that come up in any of our, our bidding efforts, we're, we're happy to um, assist in that capacity. Thank you, Lindsay. Amaury, um, how is it for Turner? Because I understand that there are multiple ways that they could come in to a project. Um, and you spoke a little about the Turner School of Construction and other choices, but how does it work for you guys? I mean, first of all, I like what previous panelists said, you know, with Luanda and Lindsay, where, you know, understand, first of all, you need to understand your business and you also need to understand the project. And sometimes when I talk to procurement, because my role at Turner, I, I, I'm in the middle, I'm between procurement and business development, right? So once we're awarded a job, all those goals that are associated with the project go to procurement. So then I transition to making sure that hey, we have an SBE goal or we have a, a CBE goal. And then sometimes our procurement officers get frustrated when they're like, hey, you gave me a list of qualified SBE subs, but they're not responding to bid requests without any response whatsoever. Or um, can we get more engagement and let's have them really let us know what they're good at? Because sometimes we have contractors where they just check off as many boxes as possible and it's just like, well, what is your bread and butter? If you had to come in and perform, what is it that you're gonna be able to stand by? Uh, even simple questions like, can you fund material and labor costs for 45 to 60 days on a project? You know, So understanding before you walk in the door, what you're capable of and what the job is asking you is, is really important. That's why you do have to ask those questions. But because at Turner, that's what it's gonna be. It's gonna be, we are awarded a project I talk to agencies like, you know, like yours at over FIU or SBDC or MBDA or other organizations and say, hey, even with city agencies, can you provide contractors? Can you recommend contractors? We start adding them to list, making sure that that information matches and then procurement will ask them to bid. And at that process, once that process starts, you need to kind of show, hey, I am, you know, capable of performing this work understand what's asked of me and we'll be accountable for the job once it's awarded and once that happens I mean once you get one job let's say you go on and you're right we do have different divisions so if you're looking at Turner Maine that's our big ground up division um, but then if you're looking at SPD you have interior jobs which have smaller contracts which are easier to be you know that low-hanging fruit so if I understand what you're capable of and what you can actually perform, I'll be able to dictate which way you should approach. That way, you know, you're actually aligning up with what makes sense for you and also what makes sense for us. Very good. And in that, I would like to add, Amaury, is very important. When we are talking about small businesses, you mentioned a few terms that we might have not covered nor said, which relate to what is it that is the meaning of those uh, DBEs and WEs? And we will hear a lot of different terms. And what we are talking about in, in our common language is about the different certifications that, there, that exist. And depending on the area, depending on the agency, you may hear the need of having a certification or to be pre-qualified so if we could actually uh, just share a synopsis of information on certification, that will be great just for the benefit of everyone to understand what we were adding on. So for example, uh, we were talking, I believe about the disadvantaged business enterprise certification for the projects of Turner. We have 
the minority certifications for the county and the schools. We have the state certification as well. So we have multiple certifications. So what I would like to do is for each of you to provide a bit of insight when it comes to what are those certifications? Why are we suggesting for you to get pre-qualified or certified that way? And uh, let's, let's say the importance of being certified if you are a small and minority owned business. We could start with Lawanda. Okay, so for Miami-Dade County government and this Miami-Dade County government, we have a local certification program. Um, it is a race and gender neutral program. It's not minority based. It's based on um, the gross, the size receipts, gross receipts and size of a company. And so we have construction, goods and services, architectural engineering, and then we have a local development LDB for work specifically um, at the airport with the rental cars. And so we have our locals, small business enterprise in those three main industries, but we are also a certified agent for the disadvantaged business enterprise certification, which is a DBE state program. And that state program basically says minorities, 51% uh, minority um, ownership, and that is, and you're socially and economically disadvantaged. And so generally that's most people. Um, and that means you're a woman, Hispanic, Indian, Black, Asian, or other, not a white male, only 51%. And so uh, the benefit of being locally certified SBE is you go have an opportunity to bid on our Miami-Dade County contracts and specifically contracts that we carve out for those certified small businesses. And those same small certified small businesses have an opportunity to have bid opportunities directly with Jackson Health. Miami Day Expressway Authority, Miami Day College. And so they use our certified firms. And we have several other cities that we're learning that use our certification list because they don't want to do the certification. And so that's local SBE. The DBE, even though we do it here um, locally, you know, it, it is it is for federally funded type contracts. So that could be aviation related, that could be seaport related, housing, transportation related, you know, anything that has transportation type costs, you know, or federal dollars tied to it, that's where the DBs come in at. So you can be DB certified in Dade County through us, but if your business is located in Broward or in Palm Beach and you go through them, you go through them. But you can also go directly through the state to do DB because it's transportation related. And so that's the difference between what we do in SBE and we're also certified agency for DBE. Can't hear you. My internet is having a lifetime today. So that is the perfect explanation because there is a lot of confusion out there. Uh, many small businesses come to us, uh, those that provide services, asking what should be the right certification? Why is it so important? Will I get an advantage by having that certification? Uh, will I get my foot in the door anytime sooner? And yes, you need to be certified. Is an advantage to be certified it is a door opening, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna happen right away for you. And I think that that is very important for us to clarify that. So Junior, if you can add on the school side for certifications. But it's very, it's similar to um, Miami-Dade County, very, very similar indeed. Um, the thing is we have got a race neutral uh, program, which is small and micro, which is revenue based. Um, and basically what it is, it's race neutral as well. And we actually um, give award goals and points based upon that. So um, if you're if there's a three or more um, businesses within an industry that are small and micro, we can probably award the points to those businesses. Um, also, there is sheltered market opportunities for the small and micro as well, um, where we in the past, the past few months ago, about a few months ago, we actually sheltered market, sheltered market some of the PPE equipment as well, um, where it was just certified businesses that were able to bid on the PPE equipment. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to it. We've also got uh, an MWBE program, which is a minority woman owned business program. Um, and that we have goals related to that too. 
but that's more in, in regards to the construction side of the house. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite in depth. And as, I mean, I can think about, it's actually covers now the tri-county area. It's not just um, Miami-Dade County, it's also Palm Beach and Broward. That happened pretty recently, where before it was just Miami-Dade. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different um, aspects to it too. We get first tier referrals, if you're a certified business to other departments. Um, we've also got um, what we call uh, a, a directory at Miami-Dade County Public Schools mm -hmm. that we give to all the schools related to certified firms that within a certain industry. And um, like I said, there are mandatory subcontracting goals um, related to certified firms in the construction side. That may change too, also to the goods and services, but we've not completed the disparity study um, related to goods and services yet. And, and then you get an, a lot a notice of upcoming contracting opportunities as well as a certified firm. Um, you can also get one-on-one -on -one counseling with us um, relating to um, if you've not been successful in being awarded a bid or you didn't submit the winning bid, you can find out the reason why you did not win the bid. Um, so there, there are various, various different uh, aspects of, the, of the, the benefits of being certified with us. Very good. Thanks for sharing the information, Junior. Lindsay, I believe that for UM is similar to FIU, that we need self-certification. Yes, that's correct. So we, we currently don't require certifications, but we certainly do encourage our vendors to get certified. Um, you know, as, as Junior and Lawanda, our, our panelists mentioned, and, um, we do have a, a self-certification process through the registration that our suppliers um, will go through. Very good. It's similar to FIU. In the case for FIU, you could actually, when you register as a vendor, you can do self-certified. But if you have the state, the county, uh, we actually um, accept it. But we do encourage everyone to pursue one of the routes uh, for certification. In terms of uh, Turner, because you were talking about uh, the goals that you had in the different projects, Amari, can you expand a little about that? So we're a lot more flexible uh, depending on the project. So walking in the door, one of the things that you can always ask as a contractor is, who's the client um, and what are their goals? Or are they goals associated? So if we're working at Palm Beach International Airport, uh, just like Lawanda said, you know, they're going to have goals attached to that because there's federal money involved. So you're going to have DBE goals. You might have county goals. Once they set that standard, then procurement has to have you know, they're gonna to try to meet that threshold to satisfy the client on those projects. But if we do have, and today I was in a call uh, and we're, we have a private client and they're open, meaning I can set the goal for the project. Now Turner has a 20% national goal, um, MWBE. So we can be uh, race and gender based if there is no pre-existing goal or it's not a state or uh, federal uh, funded project. Uh, but with the client that I, was, I had a conversation with today, they have a 40% goal that's completely open to diversity in the loosest of sense. So the benefit will be that if we have a project that has those types of goals, then we can kind of create a lot of opportunities for different businesses. Uh, not only that our SBEs, but you know your DBEs. Um, we, we were definitely not a certifying agency. I need people to know Turner does not certify uh, whether or not you're minority owned or disadvantaged business or veteran owned. Um, so we will rely on the certification process from Miami-Dade County, Broward County, Palm Beach County, um, and other certifying agencies that are recognized within the state. But if there isn't a goal attached to the project, which should always be a question, is there a goal attached to the project and what is it? Um, I will fall back on our national policy where I'm trying to get 20% MWE participation from a qualified sub that's 51% owned. Um, and I'm looking at it at any tier. So you might not win a job with Turner directly, but if you were able to provide goods and services or be a vendor to one of our prime contractors, then we will also be able to assist you with that. So we will have events like Meet the Primes where the point of that is hey, you might not be able to get a direct contract with us, but 
if you build a relationship with these prime contractors, we can negotiate with them to establish this relationship. That way these goals can actually be met and everyone allows, you know, everyone continues to build capacity. Very good. Thank you for that, Amari. And I think that is very, very relevant and important to add. Uh, Florida is a gender neutral state. Therefore, what the panelists are sharing in terms of certifications is because there have been disparity studies attached to these goals, or there is a policy in place that they could have verbiage related to it. Uh, but most likely, everything addresses small businesses. It just depends. In the case for the schools, I will use that example on the disparity study that Junior mentioned. It doesn't mean that you don't have opportunity to go after any contract. It's just that if you're a minority and you're certified and there is a pool, there is a set aside for that specific project, you have the opportunity to compete for that set aside, but you still have opportunity to go after any contract as long as you meet what is required. And if you meet the standards of completing the task, and on that note, I think that is very important to ask you, what are some examples of the goods and services that you often procure? So for example, in the schools junior, uh, what do you guys often procure? Yes, yeah, so many different things, <laughs> so many different things. Um, honestly, it's with maintenance related items. Um, those are big spenders there, hundreds of millions of dollars. We've got um, food related items, obviously in schools, um, ITS equipment, um, ITS consultant services, uh, transportation, obviously, um, for, the, for, this, for the schools, you know, parts, transportation parts, tires, um, engines, all the rest of it. It's just a myriad, everything you can think of, um, we, we really buy, we, we procure. Very good, thank you. How about the county? Oh, we buy everything from pins to helicopters is what I tell people. Um, Supplies, but, everything. It, you know, it, it's, it's amazing because <laughs> you, you're talking about not just what the county departments and employees may need, but we're talking about what the community needs. And so that could be your landscaping services around town or for the building, security guard services, promotional items, um, print work, T-shirt items, um, uh, PP and E. You know that is just because we're in the midst of the time that doesn't go away. We've always purchased, but now, of course, at a different level. Um, and, you know, we have points where we recently we've had cre crematory services. People wouldn't have thought of crematory services, but that was something we had out for, and even towing services at one point in time because you think, you know, the county doesn't need to. No, the county does need towing services, and so janitorial services, um, you know, just different odds and ends that you wouldn't, supplies, office supplies, um, carpet, um, you name it, foods, of course, recently a kosher, kosher meal plan went out on the street. And so, you know, it's always good to just look at the procurement website and see what we've purchased in the past to get an idea and what we're, what's coming up to, you know, see if it's something that you can do and that's doable for you. But there's a lot that the county purchases. Can I, just, can, I just, can I just talk okay. on, on that a second? Because on the procurement.dateschools.net, as Rwanda said, there's so many things. It's just it's just too many. It's the whole myriad of things. Anything you can think of, we buy. So if you just really go on the procurement.dateschools.net website, and as Rwanda mentioned, you can see, um, even on our website, all the different bids that we've had over the years. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, I was going to say for Junior and for Rwanda, somebody asked in the chat, what about health services? Are health services also something that the county procures? Yeah, so because Jackson Health is one of our partners that uses our certified small businesses, um, what, several areas. Now it's very hard because they have prime major contractors that they contract with for certain things, but there are small business requirements for them to carve out opportunities on medical equipment, medical supplies. Uh, we have even, um, uh, medical assistance as, as for temporary employment, those type of things. And in, in when you talk about health related, um, we still do construction in that area. We still do landscaping and painting and, and you know, carpeting and general procurement for um, the hospital in general. And so because of our partnership with 
Jackson Health, you still have some of the general basic services when it comes to health services. Now, once again, I always give a disclaimer. It's not as easy as the county because it's a hospital and they have standard um, that they're required to meet by the association that um, oversees the hospitals, but it doesn't mean it's not doable. It is doable. We do our best to carve out opportunities to give firms um, an opportunity as a subcontractor to work on those type of hospital um, contracts that may come out. Very good. Thank you, Lawanda. And it's important, they have mentioned multiple platforms where you could go and access procurement opportunities that are more of a formal bid process. There is also platforms nowadays existing that City of Miami, for example, that is not here with us is using. I am aware that University of Miami uh, has engaged in using it, uh, FIU as well, which is go, called Golf Code. Nowadays, you can access Golf Code, Golf Spin. If you Google it, it will come right up and is a free sign up, and you will have access to multiple requests from different cities, uh, universities, different anchors across the nation. But you can narrow it down to your zip codes, understand what is in your region. And those opportunities come in as a request for quote. And the request for code, uh, we could go uh, a little over what is a request for code, which not necessarily will require the entire process of a formal bid. You submit your code according to the scope that they are uh, requesting. And if you come in within the requirements and the price uh, expected, you have the opportunity to be awarded and to provide those goods or services. Normally it does come up uh, less than $75,000. At least those are the parameters for FIU specifically. Lindsay, is there a parameter for Gulf Code uh, as for University of Miami? Yes, so we do have um, competitive bidding as well. Um, and on Gulf Spend, I know that we are soliciting uh, requests for quotes. Um, the team on the procurement as well as um, sourcing does work through that website. So there is opportunities there. Um, similarly, as you mentioned, um, it'll be a, a scope of work document with specifications. We'll be looking for a particular product or service. Um, we purchase a wide variety of things um, to support the academy, the research, as well as our healthcare organizations. So um, any all different variety type of uh, professional services, um, office supplies, uh, temporary staffing. Um, and again, yes, we are also... Um, under 75,000, as you mentioned, Barbara, um, for, for the policy that we're using on GovSpend. Very good, thanks for sharing. I think that is also very important for the audience to understand. Procurement has different thresholds and depending on the thresholds, there is also maybe your easiest opportunity to come in and be awarded if depending on your size and capacities. So you need to be aware and part of your process as a small and minority owned business is to get educated on where can you have access, where do you have the opportunities and what is it that you need to strengthen your foundation or to make sure that you have your documents and set up in place to go ahead and pursue. And on that note, I would like to ask the team, what are those key steps uh, for successful bidding? Because we often hear, Hey, I placed a bid, I was not awarded. I don't understand why always the same one wins, or I don't understand why am I doing wrong that I am not winning. So on that note, uh, how about if we get started with you, Junior? What right. advice can you provide them? Well, for me personally, I don't think you should wait. If you're in a certain industry, you shouldn't wait for the bid to be released in order to start doing the research. You need to start, if you, you should go to the agency and find out Say for instance, if it was office supplies, right? When, if, you, if I provide office supplies, when does that bid expire? You start doing the work from there, the research from before, prior to the bid room being expired. So you look on the, like we said before, but Lawanda said it, I've said it a number of times. You look on the website or go to, um, go to an old uh, demand star bid and look, look it up or bid say, look up when the bid expires, go to procurement, find out when the bid expires look at it, look at the specifications that was, um, that was required at that time. It could have been a few years ago. So that when the bid is released, you're prepared. You've actually looked, you've done your pricing, you've kind of got done an understanding of what the bid entails, what the specs will be. It won't deviate very far from the original bid. 
So you'll have done that. Then also one of the very, very key steps is to go to a pre-bid conference. Now you're gonna ask me what is a pre-bid conference? When a bid is released, there's a date, there's two dates that's very important. The submission deadline date of when you should um, submit the bid. Most people just look immediately at the deadline date. I've got to get it in by two o'clock on Thursday. They so, a lot of people ignore the pre-bid conference. The pre-bid conference is a date before the deadline date where you can ask as many questions about the bid as you want. You can ask anything because what happens is when a bid is released, there's a cone of silence. The cone of silence means that the procurement staff cannot talk to you about that bid. They're very limited as to what they can tell you about the bid, all right? So you ask, why is that the case? The reason that is, is because they don't want to be seen to be any kind of preferential information given to a vendor or a, a, a group of vendors over another. So it's gonna be seen to be open and competitive, all right? What it thing is, in these pre-bid conferences, all the people that are in that industry, that are interested in that bid, in the same industry, get together and they ask the department heads and the procurement staff all the questions about the bid that they don't understand. So there's a certain section of the bid that is, they, they don't understand what you're talking about. They can ask it and find out what it means. There's actually been, in our case, in Miami-Dade County Public Schools, where, um, people in that industry in the room in the pre-bid conference have asked questions and made recommendations and we've actually made an amendment to the bid based upon that that pre-bid conference what happened in the room those questions that were asked by those vendors in the room so honestly it's that to me is one of the most key points of pre-bid conference for understanding of the bid if you don't and to refine how you're going to submit the bid and actually suggestions that you may have that the the, the, the department will take on board and procurement will take on board and make an amendment to the bid based on those things. I would also, like I said, I'd like to make sure that you say you read the bid carefully. Read the bid carefully. That is the most important thing. I don't care what bid it is, read it carefully. I've seen bids that have been submitted. They've done such a fantastic job. The bid looks beautiful, well presented and everything. And when you read the bid, they probably asked for a material. I, I'll give a silly example. I always give this example. Someone may have asked for plastic pens. You may have asked for plastic pens and they want to submit stainless steel pens. That's against the specifications. That's not what we asked for. So it's very, very important that you read the bid carefully. Um, and that's it. But I honestly believe, check the website all the time, but please do the research do the research and attend the pre-bid conference to ask the questions. Did I say that again? <laughs> Thank you, Junior. How is the process with uh, UIM, Liz? Um, yeah, so, so just to echo, echo some of what Junior said, um, likewise, we're looking for um, a complete and thorough response, read through all the sections and the terms, um, have a good um, overall understanding of the RFP opportunity. Um, we also encourage suppliers to attend uh, the bidders conference as well as an opportunity to learn um, more about the bid, ask open questions. We'll have representatives, key stakeholders that are participating in the opportunity from the department as well as supply chain services and sourcing. Um, again, reading through the dates and the deadlines are very important. There's an opportunity for, for the pre-bid, but there's also an opportunity, um, a period to answer or submit questions and the opportunity for the uh, sourcing team member to reply with answers. Um, we may also extend the date. So, you know, just keeping in tune and very mindful of all those um, things that can occur. Um, also, um, reviewing the documents that are attached. Um, if, if we're looking for a red line of, of the contract, you know, go ahead and submit that as well. That just ensures that you're, you'll be a step ahead when we, if we um, pursue into any negotiations as we get you know, deeper down the RFP process. Um, and really just um, working through the purchasing and supply chain team that are listed on the RFP, uh, limiting you know, conversations to that team member and we'll funnel through any and all uh, questions as appropriate um, and circle back with answers. So we have a very similar process um, in terms of working through the RFP um, at the University of Miami. Thank you. That being said, there is a couple of things that I would like to highlight uh, that Junior and Lindsay have mentioned. 
And one is the, the pre-bid uh, meeting and making sure that everything is done before that funnel of silence. And on that note, I think that there are two important elements that I would like to ask Lawanda on. One is what happens if you are not successful at submitting your bid, if you're not awarded? Are there any processes to assist these vendors afterwards? Do they have access to information? And I think that this is very important because we often talk about, hey, this is public information when it comes in to government specifically. You can access who won and what were the terms and conditions, but you also need to understand where do you need to work in order to be successful in the future? Do you guys provide that service in the county of Rwanda? Yes, of course we do. And that is one of the biggest things that a lot of vendors do not do. They do not come back and try to figure out why was I unsuccessful? Why did I not um, win the bid? And it is public knowledge. Once that bid has been recommended for award, first and foremost, in Miami-Dade County, you have seven days to do a bid protest. And so that bid protest could be, there was some unfair advantage that you know of firsthand. Um, there was some other unscrupulous things that may have happened that if you wanna go that route, you can go that route and sometimes that can be costly. But outside of, the, you don't know anything bad happened, you didn't win the bid and you're just wondering, what did I do differently? What, you know, why? Um, once it's awarded, give them two days, go in, email the contracting office and say, can I get a copy of the awarded bidders? Um, bid because you want to see what did they do differently. It can be sometimes something as simple as based on the supplies that they had to supply, you can't supply them at that cost. They may have a better deal with their supplier or they may have offered other things in their bid that are um, uh, an added cost to you, but it's just part of their process. And so the county is willing to pay for those added things and no additional cost. Um, or it could be simple as they knew um, they had the right skills and manpower that they can do it this many people and they can get it done. Um, this may be a first time for you. You didn't realize, okay, I didn't need 10 people. I only needed four. And you put a cost for 10 people in there. So there's a lot that can be gauged and informed by looking at the previously awarded contract. And the key with that is understanding, when we say understanding your capacity and your worth when you're bidding, that's half the battle. And so then, then you can deal with those type of um, um, mishaps. The one that I, I don't like to see and I do see is when someone miss a form, something on the form that is um, um, not allowed to be corrected. Something as simple as missing something on a form or something I see a lot of lately, especially in our service contracts, you have a five-year contract. And in that five-year contract, we have, we have allotted for you to um, have an increase each year. But you put the same cost across the board for all five years. Mm -hmm. And when you now go into this, we, we have a responsibility review to go over the bid and say, hey, are you sure this is what you can do? This is your capacity. And if you're certified with me, I'm going to have either myself or myself or my team in that room with you. And I'm going to ask that question because I can do that and say, and I'm going to ask to you, probably not in front of the buying office officers, why did you not give yourself an increase each year? And so now you have left money on the table and hopefully you weren't already underbidding. So now you realize in that instant, in that moment, oh my God, five years, I never gave one increase. My bid was already low. I'm not going to be able to do that. And you lost the bid. And so we all can't say enough. I know you're not, you know, everybody think, oh, I go work with public entities. University of Miami has all this money. FIU, the county has all this money. Look, 20 years ago, you might have done those type of contracts. Today, we're being very meticulous about who we do business with and the, the morals and the ethics of those small businesses. Because if you can come in and say morally and ethically, I can do it at this cost and this many people and blah, blah, blah. We're going to go through the, our due diligence to make sure. But if you're not even going back and seeing, oh, my God, they just said one thing different and I could have gotten it. Now, you know. And most companies, 99% of them do not go back and look at previously, you know, what, why they missed out on something. And it's public records. And so mm -hmm. I hope people take heed to that and really, really do it. And even if you haven't bid on anything yet, 
go still look at that previously awarded contract so that you can get an idea today to say, okay, this was a five-year contract five years ago. Things didn't cost this, but today it costs this. And so you have a, look, my main, the main thing is being informed. So you informed and educated as businesses, you cannot go in and say, oh, I know that site about 52 acres and they want to do X, Y, and Z. You never go to the pre-bid meeting because a lot of them aren't mandatory. You don't even send a representative. You just kind of have an idea. You, I rolled past that before. Oh, they're going to need X, Y, and Z. But, and you, and you don't read the scope of work. But when you really look at the scope of work in detail, you're like, wait a minute. They're going to need three special types of equipment to do that site. Oh, I'm going to need three teams of people. Do I have capacity for 15 people? And now, now you put a bid in, bid in or you're about to put a bid in, you're like, I can't do that. And so once again, so do your, do your due diligence. If there's pre-bid meetings, please go to those. Like Junior said, you have opportunities to bring things up that can change the scope of the work or that can change the bid and we send an addendum out. One of the things that the county does is before the pre-bid meeting, before the contract even goes out on award, to be awarded and um, not even award, to be um, solicited on the street, we have a project review process. And in that instance, we survey the businesses who were looking in, the, in that commodities to, look, to do that work. That is a prime time for us, for you to tell us, hey, I'm the industry expert, that's not what we do. That's not how we do it. That's not the resources we use. And we then take that information back to the department and say, um, you can't do it out. You can't put this out like this. You need to go back and change some things. Now you may have more people that have the capability and accessibility to bid on it. And so that's the beforehand. But if we don't catch it then, just like Junior said, in that pre-bid process, if you bring up enough stuff that the department realize, oh my, we need to go back and change some stuff, they will issue an addendum. Sometimes they even push the date back or they may reject all bids and go back and reformulate if they're totally off, you know, what it is. But it's good to speak up and ask the questions. That's great. Thank you, Lawanda. And it's very important because you brought up another point that I soon want to highlight, but I wanted to ask Amaudi. Amaudi, how was the process with Turner? Because you have to comply with the government or any private uh, client that you may have for purposes of a project. So how is the procurement process? Uh, once again, I'm going to say a lot of it is relationship building, um, just being honest, because we behave sometimes like other contractors. We, we comply with UM or FIU, and we have these packages or these contracts with them where we have to you know, adhere to their standards, their values, and their schedule. And then at the same time, once those projects are done or, or bid it out, you know, we move on because we have other work to bid or pursue ourselves. So sometimes uh, contractors do have to be diligent with regards to getting feedback. You know, if you were high or low or weren't awarded a job, you're not necessarily going to be able to log in and say, well, can I see how this occurred? It will be, do you have a, you know, do you have a relationship with me or a relationship with that procurement officer so I can tap them and say, hey, look, we had this contractor, they're a diversity owned business, they're growing, they participated in this bid, they weren't awarded, can we pull them to the side and have conversations with regards to what can they do better? How can they, maybe they missed something in the estimate, maybe they made, which is the most common thing, uh, maybe they made assumptions that weren't accurate. So that process, like I said, it might sound traditional, but a lot of it is relationship building because from job to job, you might not even be dealing with the same procurement person, you know, the same. So that team can change from one bid to the other. You can be dealing with a completely new individual on our end. Now I'm working with us to make sure that, you know, our opportunities when they come up are more visible. Um, there, you know, our deadlines are out there that we're getting out to the community that we're making sure that these contracts are accessible for qualified contractors to, you know, to perform and bid on them. But at the end of the day, um, you know, following up with that team, if you go to those meetings, you know, those pre, those pre bid meetings, you'll get the direct con the PM will be there. Someone that is on that team will be there that you can access and say, Hey, where was I? What do I need to work on? And then that way, that person has a relationship with you, has you in mind for the next opportunities, or we can even coach you as with regards to, well, these are things that you can cover for the next project. Because like you said in the beginning, we have our, on our, our own end, 
standards, schedules, budgets, and times that we have to adhere to. And that just continues through, through every tier, especially since we're heavily on the, you know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing contractors, drywall contractors. We do have some people that are doing like, you know, cleaning and other things like that. But for the most part, the bulk of our contracts are in construction, direct construction work that, put, that gets put in place. So it is going to rely a lot on us being diligent to make our information transparent, but a lot on the contractor being willing to reach out and say, hey, where was I? What can I do better? Or even advising us, they can manage up and say, hey, Amori, you know, maybe these contracts need to be posted here or, or the packages should be like this and they would make more sense. It, I'm, I'm open to all of that. Very good. And you brought up uh, similar points and that is the next point I, I want to ask about. You guys mentioned one uh, at times and, and I've seen it, I've witnessed it myself where businesses do not go into the pre-bid meeting. Uh, they don't do the connections or, or they try to network. What are the recommendations? for you guys in terms of each one of the different uh, government agencies, uh, different anchors, what is like that task list that you must complete before networking? And after that, my following question will be, can you highlight what is the importance of the networking on all of this process? And with that, we could start with Lindsay. Well, in terms of networking, I, def I definitely think persistence is key. You know, have your um, your elevator uh, pitch ready um, on hand to go, and definitely be prepared to um, to speak upon your your key capabilities and offerings. But also understand your competition, understand who may be in the um, the bidding or in some of these events as well, because I think that's very key um, in in being competitive and having a competitive edge. Um, you know, on our on our bidding opportunities. Perfect. How about uh, for the schools, Junior? We can hear you. Unmuting myself again. I don't think people are hearing me. <laughs> Listen, what it is, um, I think Lindsay has covered what, it's like she had written what I'd written down as well before. Honestly, it's verbatim. Be prepared, understanding your competition, all right? Understanding what makes you, sets you apart from your competition as well. Um, your elevated pitch, you know, make sure that you're able, that when you do connect with, with, with the, this, with be the schools or UM, FIU, the people in, when you're going to decide to network with, make sure that you come across succinct, precise, you know, not overdrawn. No, they don't want to feel that you're bombarding them completely with your product or service. Just come, you know, succinct in the elevator pitch that should be no more than, to me, uh, people say 30 seconds, but could be, could be a minute at least, the maximum. And to talk, give your card, whatever it is. Um, and also would like to say that um, what's also very important is that you kind of do your research. Check who for that organization. Who, which, who is the um, head of that department? Who are the staff in that department, all right? That requires the good or service. Now, I can tell you this, some people are, have the misunderstanding that procurement of the department that decides what we buy. It is not procurement that decides what we buy, it's the department. It could be food, it could be maintenance, it could be transportation, as I mentioned before, it could be a myriad um, academic department for the schools, school operations. It is not procurement that decides what, what we buy, all right? It's the department. So check out who are the staff in that department, who are the head of the department is. Um, in our case, I'll go on your website. You can go on FIU's website, I'm sure, the Miami-Dade County's website, whatever website you can go on and check out and do your research about which department requires the goods that you, that you need as well. So those are the different things. But well, Lindsay had really captured and given the synopsis of what was really um, needed. Very good. I would like to add, you know, when we are talking about networking, the outreach is important. Yes, you get to meet buyers. Yes, you sometimes get to meet department heads. 
But beyond that, one is for them to understand what is your business about? What is your business about? What is it that you offer? Because they might not be the buyer, but they will know of an upcoming opportunity and they got your card or your name rings a bell and they decide to reach out. It has happened to multiple entrepreneurs at times. But on that same note, it's very important for you to do the due diligence of understanding each institution. And what I mean by that is many of us, and, and Junior brought a great example, we are decentralized, which means that one end may not communicate with the other. And we are just requesting these goods and services, but it's solely done, as Junior mentioned, by a department. Procurement is just processing our request. Therefore, who is the department that is requesting? Who is it that you need to knock on the door of? And at times it does not come easy just to go in and knock on the door. So you need to be part of the events to be able to put a face or to understand how to reach. But it's part of all the research that you need to do when pursuing uh, doing business with government and anchors. And on that same note, I think that is important also to highlight who do you pitch and who do you, you just simply should not pitch to. Um, I think that that at times it's not clear for our small businesses. So Lawanda, if you would like to add something on that aspect. Uh, definitely. And I will say real quick to what you stated um, and everybody stated is correct as far as networking, but this is the number one key to networking. If you don't follow up, it all defeats the purpose. Businesses do not follow up. And so that means, and I tell my businesses, and my departments don't like what I tell my businesses because I'm an advocate for the small business we get on um, opportunities is you follow up once a quarter until you find something new or you hear something different or whatever it is, but follow up. You go to a pre meeting, please follow up because that tell a turn of the world that you're serious about it, and, okay? And so one of the things is when you talk about um, who's buying, who they should be talking to, Prime example, this week I had a gentleman, sweet gentleman, wanted to come and show me a huge presentation on this product. I don't buy anything, you know, and I kept trying to tell him that. But being who I am, I kind of had an idea what he was selling. I said, fine. I said, you got to make it brief because what I'm going to do is figure out, based on what you show me, who the people I need to refer you to in the departments. He came. I saw it. I referred him to Junior. Yeah, you did. I spoke to him. I know what you're talking about. I spoke to him and I'm, I'm going exactly. to meet with him. Yeah. And so it's very important because he was not offering something that was brand spanking new to the county, which meant he didn't have to be a lobbyist, but it was something different that maybe somebody somewhere in this entire county may have purchased. And so I get that. So one of the things for us, when you guys talk about who to talk to, we have a procurement liaison list. So you have your central procurement, and then you have the procurement liaisons. They are the buyers for the specific departments. So they are the people who you want to contact and say, hey, what are your contracts that's coming out this year? Have you been purchasing such and such? Do you plan to do that? So on and so forth. That's one way. Another way is major and something totally different. And you think this is something that's going to have to come from the director down. Now you're looking at trying to get to the director through their buyer and their assistant and that person has to have enough gumption in them to believe that the director is going to take the time out and most times the assistant the assistant director and the assistant knows what that director wants they know they're going to carve out time and take time for that it's not easy getting to that point but if you can get to the buyer and you can sell that buyer that and that buyer can go back and say hey this is something we've been thinking about we haven't thought you know we haven't done it we want to do it go to that buyer for that department we call them procurement liaisons and then they work with the main procurement to make that happen you know and so it's, it's a process you can't just now many people go to the commissioners people like they go to the commissioners that's a good way of going and doing things but hopefully that commissioner will then come and ask the question to the right parties have we done this? Have we not done that? But if you've done your due diligence as a vendor and said, look, these five departments is buying it. Um, the county would save more money if they bought it more countywide, which means you've done your due diligence and your research. And I would love for you as a commissioner to support this and talk to department directors and, and procurement and blah, blah, blah. That's another way you can get things on the table. You know? That's going around about a different way, but that happens. 
And that's what I love. Can I just say something? That's what I, um, I've got to say this. I love working with Rwanda because one of the things is um, the gentleman she spoke about, when she referred the gentleman to me, I spoke to him and I could see where there is a, could be an opportunity with the school board. So it's all about partnerships. And the same thing goes for you, uh, Barbara, as well. You refer people over to us relating to something that you think probably is not in your space right now, but could be in the school board space. So that's why not to labor the point, it's very important to go to the network opportunities that Miami-Dade County has, that um, FIU have, because the, it may not be something that they will buy, but it could be something the school board will buy and vice versa. Just wanna say that. Actually, you, you pointed out something really important, Junior. It's how we all started this community of collaboration. We networked through the Anchor Alliance. We understood what were our goals and we had affinity into the people that we wanted to serve and helping the community. And we came together to educate them. And it's the same thing that our audience should pursue is to actually be engaged that many of these events are at no cost that you really have the opportunity to educate yourself and get tools that others may be aiming and they don't know they have and they are able to access for free. And there are multiple vehicles to do so. And that among us, we refer to each other because we understand where are the opportunities and we have the ability to connect. If they learn how is the process to do the networking, they will have the same ability to connect with one of us or other people that will be connectors as well because it's about building bridges. And on that same note, I would like to actually wrap it up to ask one more thing, and it will be a piece of advice from each one of you to our businesses on how to become best at networking and on how to access tools in order to be successful at meeting. And that we could start with Amaury this time around. I got the, I got the easy one no <laughs> <laughs> no I mean everyone made great points before with regards to bidding now we're a little bit more centralized right so for instance if a, and I'll make this brief but for instance say a student that went through our Turner School program you know our head of procurement for the Florida South Florida business and, uh, and our head of pre-construction and our head of estimating all taught during that program. And back to Luanda's point, there were no follow-ups, no students, because I talked to them. I sit there in the office with them and I'm like, hey, did anyone reach out to you from the 30 something students? And very few people, if any, they get one or two, it's a lot. So when it comes to networking, the one good thing that virtual space has allowed us to do is that we can actually attend, if we're diligent, we can attend more events, right? Back then, you hop in a car, you go to a conference, you're shot for the day, right? Doesn't matter what city or state, you clear your calendar, you're not gonna get to paperwork, you're not gonna get to anything. But now I can attend this, attend something in the morning, attend something in the afternoon. So the one advice I will give to people is, as always, I'll re reinforce, understand what paperwork or documents are required from any client, whether it's UM, whether it's FIU, whether it's city, whether it's Jackson, understand what the requirements are up front. Because unfortunately, any networking event, the first question is gonna be is, are you pre-qualified, right? I, and I'm, you know, I get the same thing. I went to an event in the city of Miramar and it was literally the first question that I was asked, are you pre-qualified with us? So you get notifications of opportunities. So make sure that you have that in order. It's tedious, but it's redundant information. And then after that, just be strategic. The biggest thing I will say is be strategic because everyone has limited resources. So, Look at owners, look at clients that make sense to you. You know, maybe pursuing particular types of contracts are in your space that makes sense for your firm. So I think because we are, like I said, we have limited resources, I think the biggest thing I can have people walk away with, understand what you're good at, understand what someone else's needs are, and then be strategic to see if that aligns. Because if you go after a bad contract for your firm or an overwhelming contract for your firm, and you get tied down to something, it's gonna have long lasting effects. So I think be, being strategic is the biggest thing. I think that sometimes I meet people that just wanna land a contract with Turner and it's just like, it's not a matter of landing one with us. It's about, it's about landing the right one with us. 
That way you don't get hurt because I need you. I'm in the middle. In this entire networking event, I literally am between the contractors and then all of you can be clients and I could be reporting to all of you. So I'm dead center. And it's just a matter of just understanding what everyone needs, making sure that you're diligent and making sure that you perform when you do get an opportunity to perform. So I think those will be the, the biggest um, takeaways. Cause I've seen, I've been to a lot of conferences where people are, you know, shaking hands and, and, and talking and informing you about their stuff. But it's just like, I don't know if they went back and made the connections to make sure that that time was spent wisely. Perfect advice, Amori. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay. Uh, to summarize, no, I, I agree with, with all the statements from the panelists this evening. Um, excellent advice. Um, we're definitely in sync. Um, I would say to, to keep in close communication um, and establish a relationship here at the University of Miami with our purchasing and supply chain team. Um, we definitely have, are in a in recruitment mode here at the University of Miami. We have um, ongoing opportunities in a variety of Um, as well, I just shared out the link that leads to our, our survey where you can share out your contact information and um, also learn more about opportunities um, that we have here at the University of Miami. So again, just being pers persistent, following up. Um, if perhaps um, you weren't awarded the bid this time around, there's definitely an opportunity um, for the next bid. And we're, we'll certainly be um, open to having a um, debriefing and discussion to discuss op uh, ways and opportunities, you know, that your firm can improve for the next um, opportunity that may come up. So um, I just want to say thank you again for um, inviting me to be a, a part of the panel this evening. It was an excellent experience and I look forward to um, hearing from um, the excellent businesses that have attended and, and submitting information through our, um, through our survey platform. Thank you, Lindsay. We are glad to have you and great to connect with you. Uh, Lawanda. Okay, so um, definitely some of the same things that uh, Amari and Liz <clears throat> Lizzie have stated. Um, and I will always say, ask questions. Um, you know, you got to ask your questions. You have to know what you're getting yourself into, but you got to know yourself and your business. If you do not know what your true capacity is, I don't care if it's financial capacity, <clears throat> manpower, if you don't know your capacity, um, you don't know what you are capable of doing. And so you can have a certain capacity and bid on a contract and understand <clears throat> that you're in a position to uh, go about and obtaining the additional resources needed, then you're good. But if you go in bidding saying, oh, I'll just make it happen, I'll make it work, and, and, and it doesn't work that way. But making sure that you understand that you, you know, are asking all the right questions, follow up is always key for me. Um, and networking is a part of this entire industry. If you cannot network with people, <clears throat> if you can't go in a room, meet someone and tell someone what you can do for them, not what they can do for you, but what you can do for them. Based on your services and your business, what you can do for them in a, in a short amount of time to make them interested, um, that's not good. And sometimes that takes practice and you can practice um, separate, you know, for yourself. And then last but not least, um, keep the lines of communication open, whether you're, it's with you and your prime, you and the, the partner, the county, whomever it is, don't assume anything. Always keeps the line of communication open. And that would be it for me. Very good. Thank you, Lawanda. Junior. Without sounding redundant, I echo everything that Amari, Lawanda, Lindsay said. I, I mean, I'm not going to repeat it because it's resilience at the end of the day. You've got to be resilient. You've got to, as you said, you've got to follow up. Don't be um, demotivated because you don't win the bid the first time. You've got to continue. The people that have won bids, bids, they've not won it the first time. They've tried again and again and again until they've won the bid. One of the things I'm going to say, just two phrases um, for me sums it up, is that um, quitters never win, but winners never quit. Mm -hmm. All right, if you fail to plan, that old saying you plan to fail, follow up, resilience, self-motivate yourself, pick yourself up. If you don't win that bid, pick yourself up, re-motivate yourself again and go for the next one. All right, until you win, you win it. 
Thank you, Junior. And I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for actually joining us on this effort. We would like to take some of the Q&A questions, Brian. Yeah, I can help out. And just while I was pulling those up, I just want to reiterate, because I will repeat, they said, be prepared, um, you know, do your homework, basically who's buying, what are they buying, when are they buying, how do they buy it? Um, and then also, as Luanda said, and everybody said, follow up. Like basically make sure you follow up because a lot of times you get a business card and these guys never hear from you again. So if you don't follow up, you don't have the opportunity. Um, we actually had two questions or uh, one question, two questions for Lindsay. Um, one was from Shivani that they're registered at the University of Miami for Jagger. Um, they work with other higher ed school of medicine. They're certified WBE, MBE, WOSB, SB. How do you advise them in order to do, to do business with the IT department for development projects? And then also a second question was somebody's already working with one department, how do they work with another department? Uh, excellent questions, thank you. So um, if you're you know, looking for additional opportunities in the IT sector or already working with the department, an excellent way um, to get additional information is to actually log into the Qualtrics link I just sent out. Um, that goes to um, actually myself and I will be picking up on that action item actually as a offering a referral to the department, um, providing that direct contact to the appropriate IT resource um, that may have an opportunity in that um, category. Um, if you're already providing services, that's excellent information. That's actually a question that's part of, uh, part of the um, survey questionnaire. If you currently do business with the University of Miami or if you're a new vendor, um, which is which is great because then we can offer some additional information as far as um, getting set up in our in our vendor database as well as um, some of the other um, policies and procedures and ways to go about bidding on um, future opportunities that we have across the university. Cool. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and then Ivan has another question. He did say earlier in the Q&A that um, he loves all the panelists, but uh, Luanda was his favorite because Luanda was on fire answering about five of his questions. <laughs> so he said she's great. Um, and I agree. Um, and he said that his goal is to identify how to access the grants and money to allow universities and schools who struggle to acquire budget to get the budget they need to clean out their HVAC systems to improve their indoor quality during this pandemic. Um, so it's more like on kind of helping the schools to get more money. So I don't know if anybody wants to take that. We could say kind of contact your congressman or your your senator, um, you know, on that. But does anybody uh, have any other feedback on that? I don't see feedback. <laughs> I don't see any feedback on that. I would I would encourage Yvonne. Um, he had some some great questions. I would encourage him to definitely contact your local representatives and encourage them to provide the funding. Also, the county has a lot of things that they need funding for in terms of bridges and roads and um, different facilities and things like that. So, you know, I know you love schools and us at FIU and UM, we love that you love schools, but also don't forget the county, the school, the school board, um, everybody else, um, and they can help out on that. And then the last question was from Marcella, where she said that her company is called Safety Matters. Um, she wants to know how she can participate, register, or pre-qualify as a supplier of safety construction products. They don't install any of the materials, um, ADA tiles, rubber pavers, mats, neither the thermoplastic permanent markings. So she's looking, how can she get um, pre-registered, participate, pre-qualified? Um, I'll take a crack at it. So. <laughs> One, I put the pre-qualification process, which is the same for vendor, supplier, contractor within the link, um, within the chat box, I mean. So that, that process is the same. Now, when they go through that process for us at Turner, not all of it's going to apply to them because they don't put work into place. So, but what I want to do starting this fall is I'm going to have meet the primes events where if she's not directly selling or they're not directly selling to us, having an understanding of what firms do have to actually purchase those items to be able to perform their work. So even if that, if Turner isn't directly buying, because we're, we're expecting some of our contractors to purchase and go out and procure these items themselves. So it's a matter of just follow up with me. I'll be more than happy to work with them and just be able to reach out to those contractors that do purchase these um, services or supplies in an effort to be able to perform their work. 
Very good. Um, in terms of FIU, uh, there are multiple routes actually to access. Normally is done in this case by facilities and you need to request a meeting with the facilities department in order to introduce your products. What they will do is they will actually work around their product uh, project managers, but also with their CMs. They have different providers and they will ask you to become a vendor with one of the possible uh, suppliers in order to do partnerships. If that is the case, if it's a direct purchase, they will uh, educate you on how to go about the opportunities, where they post them and how do they work with different jobs. And you don't necessarily need to be registered as a vendor to have access to those. Uh, you can request actually your meeting to do your presentation. They will instruct you on how to proceed or who do you need to contact and so forth. And from that point on, they will also instruct you to whether or not become a vendor with FIU or with a possible part. I think also the school board, we've got a office, well, our office, the Office of Economic Opportunity, pre-qualifies um, certain vendors and with regards to this trades and stuff. So as long as you've got the licenses or whatever, we do a pre-qualification for you. And then as Barbara stated, we encourage a partnership with some of our prime vendors that we do business with. Um, and also um, one of the other things that we actually, if you want to do direct business with us, we'd also um, refer you over to our maintenance department as well as the construction side of the house. And then Junior, we did have a question for you. Can you provide a link to pre-qualify or become a vendor? Yes, hold on. You'd have to go on our oeo.dateschools.net website and it will give you, I'll put that in there and then you can, it will direct you to where you need to go to on the pre-qualification. Hold on, let me. Okay. Yeah, oeo.dateschools.net. Let me send that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, any other closing thoughts before we wrap up? I think this is good. And we've uh, been, I think, 30 minutes over. We've had like kind of 15, 20, 30 minutes over. So, that's a lot of good information for the attendees. So, we just thank our, our panelists for going up into overtime. Oh, this is great. Loves it. I'll go ahead, Amari. No, I just saying I appreciate everyone here and I look forward to engaging in more of these and um, hopefully things get better. I can meet some of you in person. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Thank you, Barbara and Brian, as always. Yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. Fantastic. It was a nice evening. Thank you again. Thank you, Barbara and Brian, for thank including the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for trusting us in these endeavors. Normally, what we aim is to serve our community and to provide them with useful information so they could become successful. And without teams like you, this will not be possible. So thanks to all of you. Yeah, and thank you, Brian, for always counting on us. Yeah, and all the panelists. And then um, good news, guys, it's almost Friday. So there you go. It's Friday. <laughs> so, but thanks again. Have a good night. And we'll be sending send in some follow-up information. So just everyone have a good night. Have Very a good, good evening. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.